Thank you, David, and good morning. Absolutely uh, delighted to be here this morning. And uh, Matthias, where's Matthias gone? Good luck on Friday. It's a real dilemma for us here in the room over who not to support, right? <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about Zap and uh, what Zap means uh, in the market. And I'm going to put it in the context of what is the problem that mobile payments are trying to fix. That's a, that's a question uh, I get asked all the time. But the key thing is, let's talk about it, some of the trends that we're seeing in the market. The first thing is we live in an era of real time. Believe this stat, we check our smartphones on average now 200 times each day, and uh, if, if some of my kids are to go by 200 times per hour, I mean, it is just going uh, exponentially. They are really becoming a, a core part uh, of our lives. Here in the UK, uh, which is different from a lot of the markets around the world, where we have a faster payments infrastructure in place, which launched back in 2007, what we're seeing is phenomenal growth in the use of the faster payments network. Now, Zap sits on the faster payment network. And what you can see from this slide is just how much that has grown in use uh, in the last six years since it's been launched. The ability to make a payment online and for the money to arrive instantly in the uh, receiving bank account. That is the modern way to make a payment today. There are eight markets worldwide that can do that today. One of the key trends that we're seeing is that is going to grow exponentially over the next five to 10 years. When you look at the amount of innovation that's gone on in payments and look at the innovation that's gone on in computing, you know, over the last six years, it's been truly phenomenal uh, just how much innovation has gone on. And you can see here a picture from the 50s, one of the large supercomputers. But now in each of our pockets, just how much computing innovation has driven this, uh, this change. And then you look at what's happened in cards. Invented back 60 years ago, hardly any innovation. Other than the fact that they're more secure, they're global, they're cross-border and we all love to use them. But fundamentally, the card model grew up in a physical world, in a shop, dealing with salesmen, traveling expenses, etc., etc., not in any way designed for a multi-channel uh, world uh, or an online world, thereby creating lots of friction. That is the problem that still remains to be solved today. Now, the other trend that's going on with all this innovation is the growth in smartphones. This is UK data. 67% of us have a smartphone as of the end of quarter one. That's interesting because that enables a whole new wave of innovation. Mobile banking, you've heard um, you know, some of the presenters this morning talking about how banking is going to revolutionize uh, the way banking is done. Mobile banking is really in the foothills. 31% of us now use have claimed to download an app and use mobile banking. Still very much in the innovator early majority phase. But again, over the next two to three years, really set to revolutionize how banking and how payments uh, are done in the UK and indeed uh, worldwide. So what industries have been disrupted over the last since the smartphone has been invented? Well, there are five industries that have been uh, disrupted. And I put to you that actually what's disrupted them isn't any better. So if you look at the smartphone, it's clearly disrupted the mobile phone. You know, I, I still harp back to the days of my Nokia or my Samsung. I loved my, my feature phone. Much better at making calls than, than the iPhone today. This is not better for surfing the internet than your PC or your laptop. And it doesn't take better pictures, albeit the innovation is getting better. But why then has this completely disrupted all these industries. In music, it is a better solution than in the hardware. This is where this thing started, and that's what really captured uh, people's imagination. So it doesn't have to be better. What is happening, though, is digital convergence onto this thing. It's convenient for customers to use. They have it in their pocket all the time, and that is ultimately the trend that customers want. So the question I put is payments going to be the next thing that's going to be disrupted by uh, the smartphone. We clearly believe that it is. 
So what's the problem? One of the problems we're trying to fix in the online world? Well, here's 27 different studies. I won't bore you with all the details. It basically says that basket abandonment online is getting worse. It sits at around 70%. This is the last eight years. There's eight years worth of studies there from every, uh, everybody you can imagine, from Forrester to Cormetrics, et cetera, et cetera. Card on file, all the innovation that's going on still hasn't solved the problem. Unless, of course, you're Apple or Amazon or some of the big guys or the food retailers where actually customers are prepared to put their card on file and so on. So that, re that problem remains to be solved. And the fundamental issue is the card model, we call it a leaky bucket because the customer has to hand over all their payment information. And that payment information is very valuable to a fraudster. In our model, we call it the empty bucket model, using tokens to shield the customer information from the merchant. So the new payment revolution that's underway, not just in Zap but across the world, by using digital tokens really does enable mobile payments and take out uh, a lot of the friction that you see today. In-store payments, much harder because actually what's there today with the cards are actually pretty good. So mobile has to offer something more. It's got to be easy. We believe contactless when NFC becomes ubiquitous, but also vouchers, loyalty, reward, and so on. Gets built into the proposition, makes it seamless, makes it quick for the retailer. So let's turn to Zap. Zap very briefly allows consumers to pay businesses for goods and services. So if we can run the first video, I'll just show you quickly a demo of our M-commerce journey. Hi, I'm Andrew, and I'm going to show you Zap, a new way to pay using just your smartphone and your existing banking app. You start by opening your browser on your smartphone and browsing to a retailer site with something you'd like to buy. You choose, say, this leather folio, press pay by Zap. That takes you automatically into your existing mobile banking app where you log in securely in the same way as today. You're now presented with a request to pay for £50. You can view your account balance and you can choose which of your existing accounts you want the money to come out of, putting you in complete control of your finances. You can also see the delivery address, which is your bank registered address, and this is where the goods are going to be shipped to. You press confirm payment. That sends the money instantly to the retailer and your account balance is updated in real time and you can see the receipt for the goods you've paid for. Press finish and you're taken automatically to the retailer confirmation page where you can see that bank authenticated delivery address. And that's that. Okay, that takes eight seconds to, uh, to do that checkout and Zap sits as part of the mobile banking app. The banks love it because it gives uh, their customers another reason to download their app. And it's fundamentally much more secure because it uses uh, digital tokens. Here's a slide on how it works. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but fundamentally, we pass around a digital token that represents the basket of goods and the destination that that request to pay needs to go. It is a push payment. So the merchant sends the customer a request to pay, and then the customer sees it on the smartphone and pushes a payment, as opposed to a card model, which is I go into your bank account when you give me your, or your uh, credit account, and go once you give me your payment detail, and I pull the payment. So fundamentally, much more secure. That, if you like, is the is the secret sauce to to mobile payments. But we say, look at. It's got to bring benefit for all constituent members because this is one of the reasons why a lot of the, um, let's call them startups or some of the big guys really struggle with payments because if you don't get it lined up that it brings benefit to a customer, a bank or a merchant, if one of those constituent members doesn't buy it, then it won't work. So we say actually the merchant and the customer are the most important in this, in this arena. The merchant because fundamentally the merchant pays, right? And actually, one of my sort of observations about payments is there's nowhere near enough focus on the merchant. Merchants aren't complicated. They want to sell more, and they want to do it at a lower cost, and they want to do it very securely. Customers just want speed, simplicity, control, security, 
Again, it's not rocket science. And banks really struggling with this whole digital agenda. You know, what do we do? Which way do we jump? How do we make sure we're not disintermediated? We're worried about Google, Apple, half the people in this room, and so on. You know, how do we make ourselves relevant again? And that's really what Zap helps make banks relevant uh, again. A little bit of data around the checkout that you've just seen. Typically, today, it takes about a minute and a half to check out on an online site. Amazon is a standard bearer, 14 seconds. That's just because you've got to log into the site. The one I just showed you, 12 seconds for Zap. The difference with Zap is that it's open to all merchants. We are an open loop solution. Uh, and that's clearly one of the things that's resonated hugely with both merchants and banks as well. So I touched on merchants. Here's the reason why you should do Zap uh, as a merchant. Higher conversion, because we take out a lot of the payment friction. We think it's anywhere from 20 to 50% sales increase from a Zap-enabled mobile um, uh, e-commerce or m-commerce solution. Significantly lower fraud. About two-thirds of the fraud is engineered uh, out of the ecosystem because of the use of digital tokens. No need for PCI DSS compliance because we're not passing any customer information. That's very relevant for NFC. One of the barriers for retailers doing NFC is clearly the hardware, but also the software, the, the certification costs. Don't need to do that with Zap because we're just passing a digital token that only lasts three minutes. So it doesn't actually matter if a fraudster gets hold of it. There's absolutely nothing they can do with it. Uh, and fundamentally, we've priced Zap to be the cheapest uh, solution in the market for launch to get to scale quickly. So I'm going to run a video of what we believe the future of payments are going to look like. That's it, thank you. Okay. So that was the pitch, but tell us about the reality of building a business when there's existing players who maybe aren't as nimble as you like. What are the two or three hardest things you have found whilst building Zap? So I think, well, probably two things. The first thing is the technology uh, hasn't been the hard part. Building the infrastructure, one of the advantages that we and a lot of people in this room will have is when you have a greenfield development, you can design it the way actually it should be. Uh, so actually the technology, the IT lift, uh, getting the talent here in London, that actually has not been a problem at all. The hard bit is building the ecosystem. So it's the belief in banks, in retailers, in distributors that actually Zap is the one to back because there's a plethora of other options available, coming to market, and it's which is the one to back has always been the real challenge in this space, which is why you know, getting, you know, getting momentum early is so important. 
and getting more and more participants is really important. So the next speaker, Sebastian from Klarna, has talked about, his company's talked about spending 100 million pounds taking the UK alone. How well funded is that? Well, so at the end of this year, the, we're owned by Vocalink, which in turn is owned by, by the UK banks. They will have invested you know, 50 million in, in getting to this, at the end of this year, getting us into market. We believe there's somewhere between another 25 to 30 million on top of that to launch the product. Is that going to be enough? Again, uh, it, you know, the key question then is what are our adoption rates like and how quickly that moves and how quickly customers really embrace it. So we believe it, that that will be sufficient, yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you.